Hello everyone, in this series I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of the common pathology questions that come in uh, the MRCS Part B exam. The first question is talking about uh, uh, infective endocarditis. And uh, the, the scenario will usually be a um, um, 48-year-old ma male patient who has a bicuspid aortic valve presented to you after a dental extraction with fever and acutely unwell. And um, usually the examiner is going to ask you a few questions. And the first question is talking about um, definition of infective endocarditis. And the answer, should, the answer should go smoothly that it is an inflammation of the endocardial surface and the heart valves in a predisposed person uh, by certain microorganisms. Um, the next question is uh, basically asking what are the risk factors uh, for developing infective endocarditis and these risk factors are primarily the um, uh, rheumatic heart valve, bicuspid aortic valve, mechanical or um, uh, prosthetic valve replacement and RV drug users and severe bacteremia or severe septicemia. So basically, the risk factors is anything that's affecting the endocardium because usually the blood uh, um, moves very smoothly in the endocardial surface. So when this is a, the, when that is disturbed, that will lead to increased risk factor of developing infective endocarditis. The next question is talking about how to establish a diagnosis. So diagnosis usually established through uh, um, a criteria called Doug's criteria. And this is the time that you will need to talk confidently about it. And the criteria is divided into major and minor criteria. The major criteria is more definitive and it talks about two things. Number one is the blood culture and number two is the echocardiographic changes. So with blood culture, if you have two positive blood culture from any patient with, uh, that you suspecting that they might have infective endocarditis, that's definitive for uh, the diagnosis. And the blood cultures need to be persistently positive in those patients for at least 12 hours apart. And if you take three positive blood cultures with one hour apart, that can confirm the diagnosis as well. On the other hand, we have the um, echocardiographic changes. You can find many things. Number one, valve vegetation is one of the commonest findings in an echocardiography. And number two is the myocardial abscess and either new or partial dehiscence in a prosthetic valve. Minor criteria are many things. Any um, uh, of the following will be uh, a little bit helpful in diagnosis. Any patient with fever more than 38.5, that's one of the minor criteria, and predisposing factors which we talked about, and vascular problem, immunological problem. Vascular problem and vascular issues include arterial ampullae and chainway lesions and conjunctival hemorrhage. And immunological problems include glomerular nephritis and rothus pots and oslo's nudes as well. Positive blood culture that did not meet the above criteria which we talked about and that included that it needs to be persistently positive in a patient with at least 12 hours apart. And number two, that it needs to also be positive in uh, 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 three positive blood cultures uh, with only one hour apart. So to sum up, Duke's criteria, major and minor criteria, and we talked about them. If you have a two major criteria positive, so that means uh, infective endocarditis is diagnosed. If you have one major and three minor criteria, it's confirmative to the diagnosis. If you have five minor criteria, again, that is confirmative to the diagnosis of infective endocarditis. Question number three, and we, we sort of answered it, which is why um, a rheumatic uh, heart valve, number five, sorry, why rheumatic heart valve and valve replacement uh, patient are high risk. And we talked about the sort of the blood usually move very smoothly on the uh, uh, endocardium and any disturbance in this will lead to increased risk of infective endocarditis. What are the common microorganisms that can lead to infective endocarditis? There are many organisms that can lead to that and this includes streptoviridins, staph aureus and coagulase negative staph as well, enterococci and the HACEC group, H-A-C-E-K group. What is the treatment for infective endocarditis? So primarily it's something infective, so antibiotic needs to be mentioned. Uh, and um, uh, the first thing that you would give to your patient is uh, either keftriaxone and vancomycin. And, uh, uh, but there might be some restriction to that. Uh, uh, if the patient have, uh, has a valve in situ, 
uh, like a prophetic valve or a mechanical valve, this will need to be taken out because that represents a septic focus for this patient. And uh, if there is no response to the medical treatment, you might consider either valve replacement or heart transplantation in those patients and that will put them at a high risk of graft rejection and giving them a steroid as well. Well, next question will be talking about warfarin and how does it work and what is, um, you know, like uh, the, the examiner will start asking you how to monitor warfarin and how to reverse it and the mechanism of action of it. So first question is asking why patients with valve replacement needs to be in warfarin because they are at high risk of developing thromboembolism. How does warfarin work? It's a vitamin K antagonist, so it's basically antagonized the factors that um, uh, are vitamin K dependent, and these are 1972. Factor 9, 10, 7, and 2. All right. Uh, how to monitor warfarin by INR? How to reverse uh, warfarin if a patient has a high INR? The way we reverse it is basically giving the patient vitamin K or the factors that are dependent on vitamin K. We can give the factors but two ways, either fresh frozen plasma or human prothrombin complex. Let me see if there is any other questions that we have, we, we, we sort of haven't uh, covered uh, today. So we asked about the mechanism of action and how to reverse warfarin and how to monitor it. Is there any like um, a coagulation system which will not be affected by warfarin? Yes, the intrinsic pathway will not be affected. The commonest valve to be affected by infective endocarditis is usually the tricuspid valve, the way you think about it. So injection will happen through the arm of the preferies and the way it goes back to the heart through the blood will go through the inferior vena cava or the superior vena cava and uh, will go to the right atrium first and then to the right ventricle through the, ven the, the tricuspid valve. So tricuspid valve is the commonest to be affected in those patients. Thank you very much.